It's a plant many Australians wouldn't recognise. But in the South Pacific, it's a market staple. This is kava, or what's technically known as Piper methysticum. It's turned into a drink by crushing the dried roots and adding water. A drink that's non-alcoholic, but can have sedative effects. Demand for kava has turned many subsistence farmers into semi-commercial growers in Fiji and transformed many rural villages. Now, Australia is playing a role in that by helping to lift the quality of kava and also allowing more of it to be imported. Drinking kava is a centuries-old tradition in Fiji. And it's in this traditional setting I meet one of the most progressive players in the kava industry, Australian Zane Yoshida. I grew up in Fiji. And I first tried kava as a 13-year-old at a friend's uh, funeral. From that young age, I believed in kava's therapeutic properties and healing properties. A long ambition of mine has been to return to Fiji and embark on the kava journey. And that's what he's doing here. After leaving Fiji to study engineering in Australia and launch startups across a range of industries in Southeast Asia and the US, the Brisbane-based businessman set up the first foreign-owned carver company in Fiji, which is now publicly listed. I'm an entrepreneur and I was inspired by the success and creation of energy drinks. I believe kava can be the relaxation drink equivalent. The company, Fiji Kava, produces both drinking kava and medicinal products that it says help with relaxation and anxiety. But before it could sell the health benefits, it had to address health concerns that have led to some countries restricting its use. In 2007, Australia banned commercial kava imports because the substance was being abused in some remote indigenous communities after being initially introduced as an alternative to alcohol. Previously, Germany banned the clinical use of kava over fears it could contribute to liver damage, a decision that was later reversed. The incidence rate of um, potential liver toxicity of Kava medicines extracted with ethanol and acetone, as an example, uh, was less than what we see today with mainstream consumption of paracetamol. While Zane says the risks were always low, his factory west of Suva aims to eliminate them, based on the recommendations of the World Health Organization. From using high-pressure cleaning equipment, to extracting the active ingredients with water instead of chemicals, and heating the kava in an industrial oven to kill any bugs. For me, this was reintroducing kava to the West um, uh, and bringing kava back to the West in a much higher quality in a standardized format uh, from farm through to shelf. To improve the farming of kava, Zane's company has invested in the Tutu Rural Training College on Fiji's third largest island, Tadiuni, which was set up to turn young people who dropped out of school into commercial farmers. The success rate is about 93%. 93% of the farmers that are trained in Tutu become commercial farmers. Not only really commercial farmers, they become village leaders, a successful model in their community who teaches others to become commercial farmers. The Carver program, which is also being funded by the Australian and New Zealand governments, grows young plants in a nursery to improve their chances of survival. The problem is that germination rate is less than 50%. So with the system that Tutu has adopted, every time you are planting kava, you are sure that the germination percentage would be 100% in the field. You are only selecting healthy seedlings from the nursery, taking it into the field and planting it. So how many varieties of kava are there and what are you focusing on? 
There's 13 varieties in Fiji in total, uh, all noble kava varieties. Mm. Uh, with our complementary medicines, our capsule and tablet formats, we use four specific varieties. And why is that? Uh, it's looking to standardize both kava lactone uh, as well as the chemotype profiles with grouping similar varieties together. So the kava lactones are the active, that's the active, active ingredient. Active constituents in the kava plant. There's yeah. six major active uh, ingredients. Well, they're not lacking moisture, are they? Certainly not, <laughs> not today. <laughs> so I'm presuming these aren't the varieties that, you know, made the uh, Australian politician a little bit wobbly? No, certainly not. So uh, the Australian pol politician drank freshly squeezed kava yeah. uh, in Micronesia and that's usually extracted using uh, slimy hibiscus bark as well. Oh. So that could have contributed to the intoxicating effect. It's a bit milder, are they? Yes, they are, <laughs> indeed. Good afternoon, young farmers and married couple. This afternoon, we'll be learning about sustainable kava production. With the number of kava farmers increasing to about 17,000 in Fiji, partly due to an influx during COVID when tourism collapsed, one big question mark is whether an industry which makes its money from pulling roots out of the soil is sustainable. We did not inherit this land from our ancestors. We borrowed it from our children of tomorrow. If you will not use it in a sustainable manner, kava won't be able to grow in that piece of land and the future generation would say, my parents have misused this part of land and I'm unable to grow kava here. So students are being taught to put plenty back in. These trees add in organic matter into the soil. They add organic matter into the soil. Uh, these trees have roots which has got root nodules which fixes soil nitrogen into the soil, improves soil biology, the soil structure improves and it is uh, good for planting the next crop. It takes three years and a lot of TLC before students get to harvest their crops. But the rewards are worth it. When you finish, when you graduate, what do you want? I like this to build my house. You want to build a house as well? On neighbouring island Vanu Levu, where 70% of Fiji's kava is grown, whole villages have been transformed around Natewa Bay. Kava is far more than a gift for the chief. It's something that has also given a lot to the farmers and families who live here. When the kava started to come in, we see a lot of big change in our village. Big changes? Yes. What changes? We are, we, that time when, when we get to get lots of money with the cover. Lots of money? Yeah. A lot more money yeah, than we had before. A lot more money than we had before. We achieved to buy material for our houses. You can see that people getting their electricity. Before we don't have this kind of solar and anything, we have it now. So this, this village that we're looking at, this is basically built on kava money? Yes, it's totally on kava. Wow. The village used to make most of its money cutting yeah. copra or coconuts. When it switched to kava, returns leapt from 20 Australian cents a kilo to $20 a kilo. And when Cyclone Winston destroyed many farms in 2016, demand pushed prices as high as $70 a kilo. This is the fresh one. The fresh one. And this is the different parts of the cover. The different parts of the yeah, cover. Yeah. So this is dried. Uh, uh, this is dry, depending on maybe this is day after. Um, and which out of these is the most valuable, expensive one? It's the waka, the roots. Really, it's, the roots? We call it the Fijian waka. And why are the roots the most valuable part? Because it's, it depends on how strong it is. Oh, this is stronger. Uh, this is strong. This is what gets the most money. Yes. While drinking kava here is steeped in tradition. What ceremonies do you use kava for? Birth, death, wedding. anything. Wedding you use it for anything wedding. happening in the village, we do that. The demand for what these farmers grow is also driven by new consumers looking for an alternative to drugs and alcohol. It's all tingly yeah. on my lips. Yeah. In the last decade, more than 400 kava bars have opened in the US. It's a market that has become increasingly important for Praveen Narayan, whose company Green Gold buys from these farmers. The main thing my farmers have achieved 
is the education of the children. If a person is not educated in life, they can't go far and they can't take their community far. But right now, the Carver High has hit a rough patch. And farmers who rely on it for everything from food to school fees are worried. The price is, uh, but this time it's very low. It's gone down a bit, mm. has it now? Before it's going up and this time it's going down. One contributing factor is something that has largely been welcomed in Fiji. In 2021, Australia lifted its ban on commercial kava imports, although it's still illegal in the Northern Territory. It's part of a pilot program that recognises the cultural significance of kava to Pacific Island communities. Praveen Narayan, whose family has been in the industry for 40 years, was quick to start exporting. But he didn't expect there to be something of a stampede. I'm a bit dumbfounded because New Zealand has been open for ages. The US has been open for ages. There wasn't that kind of rush. Oh. Then it happened to Australia. In Fiji, as at last year, we have about 375 companies registered at Kava Exporters. Out of that, around 200 exported to Australia. Total exporters from the Pacific was 430. That's a huge number. The trial, which allows for water-based kava drinks or powder to be imported, has also seen Zane Yoshida's brand land on major supermarket shelves. But there is now far more kava in Australia than the local Pacific Islander communities need. There's certainly a glut in the market. Um, as we've seen, kava prices certainly uh, collapse uh, since the kava commercial trials. We need to be able to appeal to a broader Australian population, not just a subgroup of the Australian population being Pacific Islanders. Another Australian on her own fascinating carver journey is Lindy Simpson, who didn't start off in Fiji like this. She first managed a resort in Savu Savu with her husband Bart, before stepping away to homeschool their kids. She then went looking for a backup source of income for the family. One day I was sitting at the bar with some of our staff and um, Bart said to one of our barmen, said, hey, you know, what did you do on the weekend? He goes, oh, I went to my farm. And he goes, oh, yeah, what are you farming? He goes, oh, green gold. And Bart's like, green gold? Tell me more. <laughs> and so that's where we started the conversations about carver. Lindy has turned what started as a hobby into a small commercial farm. It was quite a walk. Ten minutes, you said. Ten minutes. <laughs> across the river. <laughs> <laughs> this is the little house. Oh, this is your farm? Yes. House. Oh, I see running water. Lindy leased land from a village out in the rugged bush. We started the farm with a fork, a machete knife, our legs and a little woven basket and up we go with some casa cuttings up there. We'd all, you know, go and slashing grass as we made our tracks up to certain spots. And the farm just kept on growing. It's certainly been a steep learning curve for Lindy. He was familiar with the drink but knew nothing about farming the plant, relying on locals to teach her. And getting kava to the age when it's mature, around three years, was only half the battle, with some friends convinced the other half would be her undoing. And they just said, you're crazy. People have tried, they've never been successful. You know, sure, have a few plants, no problems, but trying to take it to a bigger scale, you become a target. That is kava. You are kava. It's a big issue. Yeah. It's the number one reason why people advise you not to do it, so I could just be stolen. They were right, her first two farms were targeted. For farm number three, she built a house in the middle for staff, which has also improved security. And have you ever been through this area affected by cyclones? Oh, many times. We've taken two direct hits. Oof. What was it, in 2020? We're one month apart from each other. The plants were fine. What we did to protect ourselves during that, we knew it was coming. We had about four days lead time to make the decision. And literally, we went running around, got a team of extra people in, and we hedged the whole plant. So we basically were cutting off the top because in the cyclone, this is going to shake. The roots will shake. When the roots shake, then it loosens the soil, then the water can get in, and that's where we get the rot. After weathering the worst of human and mother nature, 
Lindy is bringing what she knows about food quality and running an efficient business to this operation with the help of her farm manager. And which is the bit which is, has, is toxic? All of the skin on the cover is toxic. Oh, OK, so that's so you want to get rid of that. Gonna, yeah. Whatever way you want, you want to soak it or if you want to scrape it off. People usually scrape it off with knives and peelers in it just to get that majority of it out. But, but if you it, don't get rid of it, then that can cause problems? Yeah, later on, like skin like skin cracks and anything, you know, comes yeah. with it. So really... Get rid of it. Yeah, get rid of it. <laughs> From setting up a thorough cleaning process to importing a solar drying dome. So the carver is completely contained at all times. It's in our cud past stone, so when the sun rays hit the top of the dome, the stone is hot. So then we've got, even on a rainy day, we can still dry carver naturally without power. And after initially focusing on getting the farming right, she's now added a final step to the processing. $100 a kilo, Maria. Launching her own brand, which she started exporting to Australia. I launched my own brand just for the control side of things, as in I didn't want to deal with any market vendors. I don't want to deal with the fixing of prices and, you know, like I said, some of those uglier sides of um, farming and producing. By doing it myself, and after almost control. walking away when the ugly side of the business got too much, she's pretty chuffed she hung in there and swapped the beach for the bush. What is your Fiji mates who said you're absolutely crazy think now? The same person came up to my husband and I were sitting at the Planters Club Nice big tap on the back and said, I can't believe it. <laughs> I can't believe it. You know what I mean? I just I can't believe you've done it. You've done it. Like, good on you. Zane Yoshida also almost gave up on his dream after Cyclone Winston devastated his home island and ruined his supply chain. What kept you in it? Uh, my belief in Kava. Uh, I, I really feel like... Um, um, I'm on a mission uh, with this project. And after diversifying his farmer base, he's now diversifying his products to make them more appealing to people who haven't grown up on carver. Ooh. Well, Bula. Bula. Now, Zane, when we first met, we were drinking carver the very traditional way. I suspect not this. No, this is a flavoured carver shot that we've recently developed. Uh, flavoured with coconut, this one specifically. And why have you done that? Well, that's different. Well, as you probably know from tasting kava <laughs> the traditional way, uh, kava is certainly an acquired taste. It's grown on me. It's grown on me, but I like where you're going with this. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, is that to appeal to a much broader market? Yeah, certainly. I think timing's right uh, to take kava to the masses in the, yeah. in the West, uh, given the stresses of everyday life right now uh, that we're facing. To a stress-free life. Mm. To a stress-free life. <laughs>